My name is Kate McElwee. I'm the Executive Director of the Women's Ordination Conference, and I'd like to welcome you to our second day of our virtual gala celebrating 48 years of the Women's Ordination Conference. Um, some of you probably have heard me say this before, but I'm just going to say it again for those who are joining for this session, but, um, and I think it bears repeating that we arrive today on the shoulders of those visionary and courageous members of the first or organizing task force and the collective energy of the more than 1200 people who gathered Thanksgiving weekend in 1975 to claim their ministerial equality and embark on a path of renewal and hope. We honor the faith-filled and fearless leaders over the decades who have taken up the torch for walk and marched, prayed, chanted, and challenged male-dominated spaces and structures, not just as skilled activists, but as feminists, muharista, and womanist, womanist theologians, ministers, lobbyists, insiders and outsiders, and modern-day prophets. And we honor all those who are just discovering and finding new ways to live into the fierce, rich, and feminist living legacy of WAC and make it their home. The theme of this year's anniversary is a timely and tricky one, synodality and the fierce urgency of equality, the call for women's ordination now. Earlier this today, we had two very skilled theologians helping us understand this question, and what it means to hold the fierce urgency of now um, and, and equality with the, the pace of synodality. Um, this phrase, the fierce urgency of equality is taken from a uh, a phrase that Dr. Martin Luther King used, uh, the fierce urgency of now. Um, and so I'm going to share a little bit of his quote where this comes from, which is from his 1963, I had a dream speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. He said, we are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. And we are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. There is no time for apathy or complacency. This is a time for vigorous and positive action. And we have uh, Philo here, and hopefully Sheila will be joining us soon. Two very capable and, and uh, thoughtful leaders um, who took part in the Synod on Synodality in Rome, in the room where it happens. Unfortunately, Helena is not well and cannot join us today. So I know Philo is here. I'm hoping Sheila will be joining us shortly if she's not already here. We're spanning from Tokyo to Lagos to um, the US and all over. So thank you for your patience as we wait for the rest of our panel to arrive. Um, and just to say, uh, Philo and Sheila, we are so grateful for your witness, presence and ministry and your yes to accept Pope Francis's invitation to participate and share your gifts with the Synod and therefore the global church. We at WAC also accepted Pope Francis's invitation to journey towards a more synodal church. And throughout the listening phase of the Synod, we sought to empower as many women as possible to participate in that process. We learned, and I'm sure many of you share this experience, that this is uphill work requiring vulnerability, and an unwavering belief in the movement of the Holy Spirit. One participant in our first listening session described the feeling of trying to love again after heartbreak, a tension that was echoed by many others. The institutional church has broken the hearts of many women. And we learned that their hurt was raw and tender and, need, and in need of deep healing. We were also in Rome during the Synod and through creative, bold and spirit-filled witness, we worked to enlarge the synodal tent to truly include those most marginalized by the church. And yet for many here and poignantly as we mark our 48th anniversary, this feels too late. Um, we chose this theme because the Synod on Citadality is a Kairos moment for the church, one where the imperative to walk together meets God's urgent call for loving justice and radical equality. Yet the pace of synodality can feel too slow, too late, justice deferred, and it just, it just does not attend to the injustices of patriarchy, misogyny, and sexism. So how do we hold this dynamic tension with authenticity, hope, and the fierce urgency of now? I'm excited to dig into this conversation and to hear some experiences from the Synod Hall 
Um, but first, I'm going to invite my colleague, Katie Lace, our program director, to lead us in an opening prayer. Thank you, Kate. Our prayer today is the prayer that uh, the Women's Ordination Conference has been using all uh, through our time in Rome and around the world last month and are continuing to use as the Synod continues. And so wherever we are across all of these time zones and continents, we are on holy ground. And so we pray. Source, sojourner, and spirit. To journey with you is to walk with our gazes fixed upon a horizon of hope. To journey with one another is our challenge and our calling. You call us to move with missionary urgency to become a more vibrantly living sign of your love in the world. Break us out of worn paths. Free us from the thickets of, we've always done it this way. And for those who may be frightened by the new vista revealed, grant boldness of heart. May we become a church where all vocations are welcomed, celebrated, and nurtured. Where your priests reflect the diversity of your people, and where our structures are at the service of your kingdom of radically loving inclusion. Cultivate in us a holy, healthy restlessness on this synodal path. Make us unafraid of prophetic decisions that take us along uncharted territory. Give us the radical unity that is your gift and your promise. Grant us generosity of trust and expansiveness of hope as we say, amen. May it be so. Amen. Thank you, Katie. Amen. Now it's my great honor to introduce our two speakers for today. Um, we will hear from Sister Philo Hirota, a Mercedarian missionary of Belize, who has many roles in peace and nonviolent and human rights organizations including serving as an advisor from Japan for the Catholic Council of Justice and Peace, on the executive committee of the Catholic Nonviolent Initiative Pax Christi, coordinator for Talitha Kum in Japan, and a board member of Women's War and Peace Human Rights Fund, among many, many other roles. And Sheila Pyrus is the communications officer of the South African Catholic Bishops Conference and serves as secretary on the Commission for Information for the 16th Ordinary General Assembly of the Synod of Bishops. She is also a Vatican News collaborator. You probably saw, if you were watching the daily press conferences, you saw a lot of her uh, as she was helping to moderate those conversations. So it's my honor to first in, uh, welcome Sister Filo to share a bit of a, her experience of the Synod and to reflect on this theme of urgency to attend to injustice and tension with the pace of synodality. Um, so I know Filo has some slides that she'd like to share, so I'll pass it off to you, Filo. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Congratulations to the uh, Women's Ordination Conference for the anniversary. Um, uh, first, I would um, briefly share my experience of uh, becoming a member of Synod Preparatory Committee. I participated uh, in the general conference of the Federation of Asian Bishops Conferences um, in October 2022 in Bangkok, where I met Cardinal Holich, uh, Synod General Relator. Sometime after, I, I received an email from him asking me if I was willing to be a member of the Synod Preparatory Committee. I thought I would be one of many from Asia. Then I realized that I thought I realized that I was the only woman with two cardinals, three bishops, and three priests. And I thought, oh, well, the Synod Secretariat must be very conscious of gender balance. It's not really balance, but anyway. At least 
I can be a reminder. And the experience has been quite positive. For example, I expect my appreciation of the committee uh, addressing each one with his first name, creating uh, equal relationships. And when we met Pope, he saw me and Federica from the Synod Secretariat, and he exclaimed, donne, women, as if he had not expect expected to see us. Well, he sounded happy. I think I shared uh, this um, experience with NCR. Um, now about the Synod. At the beginning of the Synod, New York Times said a Synod that is potentially revolutionary begins. Then, when the first session ended on October 29th, some media commented there was no revolutionary change. Mother Maria Ignazia Angelini, an Italian Benedictine who offered spiritual reflections throughout the Synod meeting, together with Timothy Radcliffe, said she believes this Synod has been a very significant event and described the process as revolutionary of change of process towards new forms of inclusion and listening with the capacity to really look at reality. I agree with her. This synod was undoubtedly a very significant and revolutionary event of change and possible changes in the church in today's world. The objective of the synod, as you know, is to discern a new way of being church in the 21st century. It's about the whole church and the entire people of God in the world, ideally. Ideally, 1.3 billion are asked to share what they experience and feel about the church, though the outcome of the preparatory process until the opening of the first session uh, for the first session was numerically quite learned. I learned, for example, only 1% of the Catholics in the U.S. actively participated in the uh, preparation. But there were some tangible novelties experienced during the first session. One example that the round table setting of this synod gave us a concrete experience of a synodal church. I participated in the Synod of Asia 25 years ago. The participants were sitting in rows according to their ecclesiastical rankings. Pope on the stage facing the assembly, then cardinals, archbishops, bishops, priests who were ordained with voting right, and auditors, non-ordained, religious, and laymen and women way at the back. It was a lived experience of the hierarchical church every day. This time, a roundtable enabled equal relationships of brotherhood and sisterhood. Cardinals, bishops, priests, lay men and women, each one had four minutes to talk and had to obey the facilitator who could be a lay woman. I wonder if one from the Vatican Curia ever had an experience of obeying a woman facilitator. Cardinal Cherney, prefect of the uh, Dicastery of Integral Human Development, said, round tables are absolutely essential, the most important symbol, icon of the Synod. Sister Maria Dolores Palencia from Mexico, uh, sisters, sister of St. Joseph, uh, one of the president delegates, this is also something new, said, the setting created closeness. We began talking using two. She was talking in, in Spanish, and as you know, in Spanish, you have two and usted. 
Some bishops shared jokes in mobiles. The president of a synod is the Pope. In other synods, three bishops presided in the name of the Supreme Pontiff. This time, there were nine president delegates, including two women. One was uh, Sister Maria Dolores, and the other was one was uh, Momoko Nishimura, a Japanese consecrated woman who lived in Argentina. So she was sharing a cup of mate tea with Pope at the table. The methodology was also new. A synod until now had the draft from the beginning for sharing, discussion, and voting. This means that there was a document from the beginning. This synod introduced the conversation in the spirit as a methodology, which is a journey of communal discernment. There was no document to be voted on, but a worksheet of questions. In other synod, each participant came prepared to give his or her intervention. In this synod, each participant came prepared to listen to the spirit who speaks through the word, through the signs of the times, in others, in a process of prayerful reflection and silence. Silence was very important. Each table had a secretary and a rapporteur who gave a summary report of two pages at the plenary assembly. I don't think that every participant was positive about the synodal me method of conversation in the spirit. However, as we continued sharing one's personal experience at the table, because we were asked to share in this discernment process, to share our our experience, not ideas. I sort of sense that the bishops and cardinals began to relax. And that atmosphere of freedom was created. We didn't have to draw a conclusion. There was no discussion or debate. Basically, it was a process of respectful listening to come to know each other at deeper personal level. Sometimes the conversation continued during coffee break. I should say it was a unique privileged opportunity to come to know the diversity of the universal church. I never listened to someone from an African country sharing about his polygamous father who had five wives and 28 children, or the woman married to an Eastern Catholic priest sharing a positive aspect of a married priest. Some intervention at the plenary assembly, general conference it was called, was impacting. Luis Casalini from Mediterranean Saving Humans, Italian activist who works in the Mediterranean Sea saving migrant and refugee people. Pope always says, don't let the Mediterranean, Mediterranean become a graveyard anymore, any longer. Luca had a criminal charge. Luca, Luca had the criminal church charge of human trafficking for the government's anti-migration policy. I should say it must be the first time that a person with a criminal record attended the uh, a synod. It must be the first time, I guess. Anyways. Enrique Aralcón García, president of Frater España, Fraternidad Cristiana de Personas con Discapacidad, Spain. I don't think a person with a wheelchair ever been in a synod. Although There was no LGBTQA representative. James Martin Jesuit was there, who is a passionate and committed advocate. A young woman from the USA shared her personal experience of having a lesbian sister. I'm sure you have read it. 
he, she had not been to church, but went to confession. She went to confession because of her grandmother. The priest said, this was in Poland, disordered and did not give her absolution. She killed herself when she was 21 years old. Her sharing impacted the whole assembly. Synod also spoke a lot about the poor. Cardinal Conrad, papal almoner, was present. During the Synod, he organized a meal with the Pope, inviting the homeless near the Vatican. He asked what they wanted from the Synod. They answered, love. The fact that the bishops did not have to wear their Episcopal attire every day also helped to create normalcy. I remember what I witnessed in 1998 at the Asian Synod. A bishop from Indonesia who was not wearing filetta was told that he was lacking respect for the Holy Father. He presented himself with the Episcopal attire on the next day. Um, I mention this because Vatican is a place at least until now, is a place where one, what one wear is very important. I remember going to the synod, uh, synod office before the uh, the synod. This is uh, twenty five years ago, and uh, uh, and the person looked at me. I mean, the priest looked at me and he said, "Where is your habit?" <laughs> so I said, that "This is my habit." Um, another important aspect of the synodal experience is that of being a woman at the church. The presence of women at the synod did make a difference. The men listened attentively and respectfully in general. For some, it must have been a new experience of meeting the whole bunch of women who are confident, assertive, articulate, clear, and insightful sitting together around the table. I also have mixed feeling about the synod, that the document scrapped LGBTQA+, were only asks for further study on the question of the acronym for women is disappointment. I would say, however, that the synod reflects and we experience the reality of this universal church of diversity. If the synod church is the people of God who work together, accepting and valuing diversity, the synthesis appears to us, or to me, of the reality of the synodal assembly that tries work together. Synod is called, I mean, the church is called to accept and embrace diversity. So, uh, but the hope is that these questions are not closed. They are open to further reflection from the people of God, from us. There are matters for consideration and 81 proposals in the synthesis report. And this is, this is a call for all of us to continue the conversation in the spirit. Okay, so I stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sister Philo, for your perspective on this incredible um, historic moment in our church. I, I can hear in your voice hope and disappointment and yet so much change happened in the room um, and so that experience is just so um, hopefully it's transformative personally but also transformative for the church so thank you I'm going to now invite Sheila Pyrus to offer her reflection about her experience and um, wore many hats in the synod hall and beyond um, and so we'd love to hear your perspective uh, let me try to find you in the here. There you are. Hi there. Can you hear Hi. me? <laughs> yes. Okay. Wonderful. Right. Thank you for being with us. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Greetings from Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, please do note that there are blackouts every now and then. I pray it won't happen now. All right. Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. So for me, the first general congregation of the Synod of Bishops was truly an experience of synodality, of journeying together, of fraternity, of sharing our Catholic diversity as we represented Catholic communities from different realities and cultures. But before I proceed, I would really love to express my gratitude to our Holy Father Pope Francis and to everyone who supported the decision to allow religious sisters, laymen, women, and the youth to be active voting members of the 16th Ordinary General Assembly of the Synod of Bishops, which many of us call it a Kairos moment for the Catholic Church. So as you asked, Kate, that we share our experiences during the synodal uh, journey, the synodal assembly, I, I remember the first thought that came to mind was the time I represented my parish at the Archdiocesan Synod, which was back in 2008 in Johannesburg, South Africa. So this particular synod for me was my first experience as a synod of bishops. However, as a synod, synod, I've had that experience at parish level uh, dating back to 2008. So as I've mentioned before in previous presentations is that there are so many moments and uh, lived experiences of this particular synod assembly that stood out for me. However, the Synod of Bishops was for me a learning experience as we were placed in groups, like our previous speaker just said, we were placed in groups of 12 with 10 voting members. And also the whole experience of the round table set up brought that sense of fami familiarity. And remember that members in the small groups were divided by continents. Sometimes we found ourselves in a group made up of members from Africa, North America, Latin America, Asia, Eastern churches, and the Middle East, Europe, and Oceania. So having that opportunity to engage with cardinals, with bishops, with priests, religious sisters, laymen and women, including young people from different parts of the world, as well as fraternal delegates from the four major Christian traditions was for me very enriching. So that's what I wanted to say about the synodal experience in a nutshell. But again, being among the first group of lay women chosen to participate with a voting right at a synod of bishops was for me a blessing beyond description. And one cannot but Thank God for being part of uh, this uh, 16th Ordinary uh, General Assembly of the Synod of Bishops. It is a Kairos moment. You are correct to say that it is a Kairos moment. It is an historical moment for the Catholic Church. And one thing that stood out for me was the introduction of conversations in the spirit methodology, which helped us to learn to listen more listen to one another and to reflect more to analyze and you know those moments of silence that we would have after listening to the sharing that helped us to think before we speak we often tend to just speak we tend to listen already with a mind that it's a sort of like a set that this is what i want to hear from that answer but this methodology, the conversations in the spirit methodology actually helped us to learn how to listen attentively, to reflect and to breathe, to calm down before we make a comment or an addition to whatever it is that we heard that was shared. And so we were introduced to this conversation in the spirit during the three day retreat, which was prior to the open, official opening of the Senate. 
And it was during this retreat when we introduced to what we say in a country like South Africa, the spirit of Ubuntu, which means I am because you are. Now the spirit of Ubuntu for me, it's like, you know, if you compare to the conversations and the spirits is that we learn to speak in one accord, in one voice as a church, not as individuals, not as a group, but as the Catholic Church. So what do we as Catholics say? It's not about what Shayla wants. It's not about what uh, somebody else wants, but it's about us as a church coming together, dialoguing, journeying, and discerning together. So, Coming now to the theme of today's conversation, synodality and the fierce urgency of equality. As a Catholic journalist, like you mentioned earlier, I've worked as a Catholic journalist for quite some time now, more than 19 years. So as a Catholic journalist, I've come across and interacted with women from different geographical areas. And as we know, women are the backbone of the Catholic Church as we are actively involved mainly at parish level, diocesan level, uh, we are quite involved. We have different roles within the church. And uh, some Episcopal conferences also have religious women serving as secretary generals or even as associate uh, secretary generals. But looking at the synthesis report, we did see there that, that Women want to be part of decision-making processes. We don't just want to be consulted. You want to be part of those decision-making processes. Now, in conversations with women throughout my years as a journalist, as a Catholic journalist, some women express a desire to be part of the decision-making, as I mentioned. In some areas like Latin America, for example, some women say the Catholic Church should consider women deacons. Uh, some parts of Europe, I'm not sure of America. Uh, yes, I have interacted with a few from America uh, calling for the ordination of women to the priesthood. Now, my question is, are we as women speaking with one accord or are we driving personal agendas? How do Catholic women globally feel about their role within the church? These are the questions that came to mind as I was preparing for this presentation, for this sharing rather. And also based on my interactions, I noticed that as Catholic women, we have different vocations. Just like any group within the church, we have different vocations. And so I ask, what sort of equality do we want as women in the Catholic church? And I ask that we reflect on this and answer as we and not as I, but as we. What is it that we, women in the Catholic Church, want? And, you know, I think of all the reports that I've seen recently, some reports saying that, oh, African, Africa came out tops because lots of their theologies uh, came up in the synthesis report uh, because the letters LGBTQI plus were not mentioned, rather something else, or because polygamy, Africa was allowed to go and discuss polygamy at second level. And it's not about winning. It's not about who came out as, as winners out of this first stage of the synodal process, but it's about what was shared during the synod conversations. And as we continue journeying to the next phase of the synodal uh, process, which is culminating already next October, we have between now and next October to continue this conversation. And as women, I would really love to hear a collective voice from women all over the world. What is it that we as women really want? Yes, we've said we want to be part of decision-making processes. But what else is there? And I think that's where I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you so much. You've given us a lot of good questions and I'm sure that 
um, people here would like to ask you both some questions now. Um, so I'm going to open up the conversation to um, dialogue from, from people who are here. So if you have a question, please feel free to put it into the chat or raise your hand and I will call on you. Anyone have a question to start with? I guess maybe one question that I have, and I you both sort of talked about the what was missing in the synthesis document that came out and the the, the moniker LGBTQ wasn't there. And I just wondered when you saw the draft document or you saw what you might be what might be voted on in the end, um, what your kind of personal prayer around it was and if you felt like it reflected the conversations that were held in in the in the synod throughout the synod or if you felt like it was deficient in some ways or 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 didn't wasn't true to the depth of the conversation on certain issues or were overall were you quite were you satisfied with the document that was ultimately voted on Okay, I don't know if Philo wants to say something. No, I just go ahead. <laughs> no, okay, all right. Now, I, what I wanted to say is that um, when we, sorry, some people have just walked in here. All right, so as I was saying, that when we talk about um, the question of the LGBTQI, it comes back to the answer I gave that we were taught to move from the I to the we, as in we speak as we. I'm no longer representing only women or representing only young people or representing only this specific group of people, but I'm there as a Catholic, whether I'm a man, woman, priest, bishop, I'm there as a Catholic, as a child of God. For me, that was my understanding. As much as I want to also share about what I bring from where I come from, the realities of the experiences of the church where I come from, in this case, is obviously the church in Africa. So that was my understanding. And again, that synthesis report was a reflection of what we discussed during the group sessions. And although the specific letters are not there, there is a mention that we do consider people of a specific sexual orientation orientation that the church welcomes, not that we do consider, I beg your pardon, but the church is a, like a welcoming home. It's like a mother who welcomes all her children, regardless of the way that child is. We welcome all our children. That's what the church, that's what the Catholic church should be. And that the Catholic church should be pro poor one that walks with the poor. And by walking with the poor, it doesn't necessarily mean the poor in spirit, the poor in material, uh, material, but it's a church that comes down to the level, to our level. That's my understanding. I, I stand to be corrected. Okay, thank you. So it sounds like you felt like the document was faithful to the conversation that were, was had. Um, uh, Sister Vila, I don't know if you had a reflection of when you saw or you know heard read the the draft document the interim document if you felt like it was authentic and, and rooted in the conversation or if you were disappointed in some way with what what was mentioned or not mentioned yeah um we got the uh the document very late and uh it was i mean we didn't have i mean i didn't have enough time to really read well so, uh, but then afterwards, when I read it again, um, where you have a um, section of convergence and matters uh, for consideration and 
uh, 81 proposals. And uh, some of them are really, I mean, it's, it's a proposal sort of proposing a structural change also in the church. I, I thought that, uh, well, I mean, the, uh, the continental, uh, there was a, this guide document, uh, extend the space of your stent. And that was a very clear call to be a radically inclusive church, not to leave anybody be behind. And I thought that that uh, document was quite, uh, I mean, I um, inspiring in the sense that, for example, the question of LGBTQA has had never been dealt that way in the church official uh, document. The church has been either uh, ignored or condemned. But this time, um, I think the church was trying really to look into the person who suffer. And then we try to listen to their voice. Now, when we come together to the Synod Hall, we realize how diverse is the church. And, and, and also that uh, this time, I mean, uh, my only sort of reference, I mean, the, on the, uh, the level of experience is that 25 years ago. Ten, 25 years ago, I didn't feel so much. I mean, it was an Asia synod. But, uh, and although we have been having this FABC who insist on the, the uh, need of um, living dialogue with the poor and the cultures and uh, religions, that is living dialogue with the diversity, uh, this time, I think that our uh, continental group was much more sort of um, united in a way. I mean, that we knew each other very well. It was a personal um, sort of relationship, and that helped. So uh, we heard, uh, like, for, for example, I have never met anyone who said, I, my father had five women and uh we are 28 uh brothers and sisters you know and uh and and that is also a problem because the polygamous catholic father cannot receive communion so but but this this was heard so i think in a way that uh, the document reflects what the the uh the church that tries to be synodal Mm -hmm. And then also the important thing is that I think the, uh, there's a sort of um, insistence that the conflict, I mean, the uh, diversity should not lead to conflict or division. And uh, we try to embrace the diversity, uh, which the Catholic Church is not accustomed to. The Catholic Church is not... Is not I mean, it, it, Catholic Church really doesn't know how to embrace diversity. Um, but anyway, I think that in this sense, the 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 synthesis uh, report reflects uh, what this uh, synodal community assembly tries to do. And uh, although I mean I I I share also disappointment, but this this disappointment is what we feel about the church right now. And then we will need to continue. Uh, sort of dealing with this uh, disappointment. Yeah. I think. Yeah. I have a follow up question in the chat that came to me about diversity. So maybe I'll just go to that and then we'll go to you, Donna and Elise, Elisa. Um, so this is a question that um, someone submitted saying, I felt that this year's synod participants reflected a broad range of perspectives, thanks to those who planned the synod. Um, this person is concerned that um, this synod could look very different under a future administration with a more narrow participation or range of synod participants. How can you imagine a way to safeguard the diversity of synodal participants in the future? And this is maybe for both of you. How can you imagine a way to safeguard the diversity of synodal participants in, in future administrations of the of the church? Um, 
Well, I think just thinking out here, um, one thing I noticed was that during this Synod Assembly, we were a group of diversity. You know, we came from diverse backgrounds. Uh, we had different cultures. A lot was shared. We had that opportunity to share on a personal level, as well as to share as a group, as we had these conversations in the spirit. But the level of respect, that's what I loved. The conversations in the spirit not only allowed us to engage with one another, but it allowed us to respect each other's views, each other's uh, beliefs, each whatever it is that we shared. You never felt like, oh, did I sound stupid saying that? Or oh, did I sound less educated compared to the theologians that are here and the doctors and so forth? But there was that level of respect. And I think that brought a sense of um, not the richness of our diversity. It's our diversity that makes us such a beautiful, Catholic, universal Catholic Church. I personally feel that this synodal experience, I learned a lot. I learned about a lot about other cultures. And also I, I saw that there's a lot of common practices, especially if you look at the churches in Africa, the churches in Asia, there's a lot of common practices. By that, I mean um, things as such as your small Christian communities. You look at Africa, you look at Asia, we both practice that, yet we are different in our cultures in a way. So for me, the question of respecting the diversity going forward, I don't think that's a question really, because already we are respecting that diversity. I think Thank I'll you. stop there. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you I, uh, yes, I, I, I agree. Um, I think the uh, the conversation around the round table round table is a very um, sort of enriching experience. Um, I think everybody was heard and listened, and uh, and and then also, I I I think the method of a conversation in the spirit helped this uh, process because first you share, and everybody listens. So the uh, in a way that the first round is uh, what I prayed or what I reflected, and then the second round is is not uh, what I I heard uh, what I uh, think, but I heard. So that means that uh, I mean uh, the second round is is a process to uh, become from I to we, so we trying to be we, and. Uh, but of course, this time, uh, we didn't have to come to conclusion. So the, uh, the, the facilitator or reporter or secretary just uh, recorded what are the conversions, what are the diversities, and et cetera. So in this way, it was, a, I mean, it helped us uh, to, to carry on the more sort of not heated discussion, but uh, calm uh, exchange of uh, uh, oneself, I mean, each one. But then the uh, I, I wonder how the methodology would work uh, next, uh, I mean, second session. But of course, I mean, there was a sort of like a criticism that the uh, Theology, theological reflection is, um, and we need more theological reflection. And then also from the, uh, uh, what we are talking about uh, brings about the uh, canonical structural change. So uh, I think the, the one of the uh, sort of proposal is uh, to come up with intercontinental commission of theologians and canonists. Mm. So I think there would be a, uh, um, based on the uh, outcome of the first session, there will be a sort of a preparatory process, and uh, some. Uh, I, I, and now I think the uh, the people, um, the participants, uh, are tr trying to sort of prepare how how to go about this uh, eleven month 
So, yeah. so in, in this sense, I think uh, it, it's a, now it's a different sort of uh, stage we are. Yeah. And, and it could be more challenging. But I think the, uh, the question of decision making and decision taking uh, would be, um, uh, I think, the, uh, respected and uh, lived. And then also the, the, there's a question of, is this really synod of bishops? And there was a question. So, yeah. And, and uh, I remember Timothy Radcliffe said that this is the way that the bishop should work. So I, I think because the, the, the challenge is the church has never been so divided and polarized. Mm. So how, how can we sort of carry on this nodal journey in this divided church? It, it, it's a big, big challenge, I think. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you both. Um, I'm going to hear the questions are coming now. So Donna um, in Albuquerque, um, do you want to turn on your screen and go, go um, for it? Okay. Um, I had a question or concern about what Sheila had said about, if I understood this correctly, that you wanted to hear what women want, you know, like across the board. And my concern is that women are diverse. They're not, and that diversity is important. And I don't think that we can narrow it down to say what women want. I, I don't think that's doable and I don't think it's needed. I think that um, we can have unity without uniformity. You know, women can come together from different backgrounds, different belief systems. Just this issue of women's ordination, the church I go to, they're terribly against it. They don't understand why we need free. And I can't understand why they would think that way, you know, and to kind of get one opinion on the subject, I, you know, I think the options need to be open and kept open and not try and, like I said, um, think of women as monolithic in their opinions. I don't think that's doable. and. You know, if I misunderstood what you said, Sheila, forgive me, but that's what it sounded like and it made me a little concerned, so. No, thank you. Thanks, Donna. Uh, just to recap a little bit what I said, I said, I, I think I began by mentioning that I've spoken to women from different backgrounds, from different geographical areas. And I mentioned that in some areas, like for example, Latin America, there's that call for uh, the diaconate of women. In some places like some parts of Europe and America, the, at least the women that I've spoken with have expressed the desire to be ordained as priests, to be priests. And women in Africa, for example, who have been given different roles within the church have expressed the desire to go higher, as in to be part of the decision-making processes, not just to be consulted, but to be part of the decision-making as well. So my question at the end was, what do we as Catholic women want? Because it would be good to know more. Where are we standing? What are we lacking? What is it that we didn't report back during the Synod? Did we miss anything as we were each giving our own perspectives, sharing our experiences? Because remember, we were women from different continents and we have different experiences. So that was my question. What is it that we as Catholic women want? And yes, it doesn't have to be one collective answer. Hence, I said, this diversity. There are different um, experiences, different aspirations, different vocations. That was the word I used, different vocations. 
we all have a different vocation. Yeah. Thank you, Ella. Um, Alyssa, I'm gonna move on, sorry, Donna, to the next question. Um, Alyssa, do you, your turn. Yes, hi all. This is, I've been a quiet member of your organization and this is my first event. I'm super grateful uh, for you holding this event, super grateful for Sister Philo and Sheila's service. Um, so my day job and this, um, oh my gosh, I, at least a two decade career in feminism and political organizing in the United States. I've always said that my politics and my line of work was definitely heavily influenced um, by the Catholic Church and the social justice piece, um, which surprises a lot of people. And I just want to say that, um, so I, for my job, I read a lot of polling um, of Catholics, and I know for a fact that most overwhelming uh, Catholic women do use birth control, which is why we don't have a lot of 10 and 12 member families do have abortions, they are with us on the issues, and yet the hierarchy, and I want to separate the church membership from the hierarchy, is one of our heaviest well-moneyed lobbyists in Congress. Like when we're up on these issues, I, um, you know, the bishops are on the opposing side. And what I would love to hear from Sister Philo and Sheila is how do we as organizers here in the United States um, you know, um, are able to neutralize those harms. You know, as a Catholic mother, I've sent my fair share letters. I don't know if they're received. I don't know if they, if if they even care. You know, but I I just want to know how um, you know, as someone who is on here on both sides how to neutralize the harms by the leadership, which I can tell you does not reflect the membership of the church at all um, and our daily lives as women and mothers. Thanks for that very important question and welcome. <laughs> Thank you. I feel you want to go first. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Um, I was, I mean, we know that the after Vatican II, that the Pope uh, Paul the Six, Saint Paul the Six, uh, publicized the Humanae Vitae. And it's so clear that the uh, people of God ignored, I, I should say, <laughs> respectfully ignored. And uh, my, my congregation is um, uh, founded in Basque country in northern Spain, where they used to have many vocations, many children, and... Uh, now the the uh, I mean the Spain doesn't have so many children and uh, Spain doesn't have so many religious uh, sisters and brothers anymore. So in such a short period of time, I should say, in less than hundred years, the culture changed drastically. So this is what people live, and uh, we also talked about census fide. And uh, so that that's a fact. That's 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 a fact. And uh, there should be a sort of pastoral understanding about this. And uh, abortion has become such a political issue. And uh, and it, I mean, abortion really divides people. I I just read that the U.S. Uh, Bishops Conference uh, again, sort of. Uh, I think uh, decided that the abortion should be a sort of like a priority issue or something like that, and um, and and then I I really think that that the way that we uh, deal with the uh, the question of this pro life and pro choice 
I mean, impression I have is not, it's, it's, it is not no longer sort of like faith uh, question of followers of Jesus of Nazareth. So I think we really have to, I mean, okay, I mean, there are all, there is always much diversity and also different experience. And um, as uh, celibate men and women, the, uh, that's what the uh, Cardinal Holich said, we are all men here. Um, in one of the, uh, when he presented the, uh, the, the, the issue, not not the issue of abortion, but the uh, the different module of uh, and and so so there are a whole bunch of people who are not who who do not have the uh, lived experience are uh, saying things and doing things. So somehow I think I think the one of the things that the, we we are learning from the synodal church is to listen to listen and not the uh, sort of uh, abstract uh, debate, but re to really listen, dialogue, enter into the world of the other. Uh, in the, the Asian church said that, uh, okay, take off your, your shoes because you are stepping the holy ground. So is there any other way to deal with all these very uh, painful issues for many. I think that's, that's what uh, the, the church is asked to be more pastoral, uh, more Jesus-like uh, sort of uh, way of uh, dealing with the people, I mean, the suffering people, especially women. So I think that's, uh, one and and then again, I I I, th I think we need to learn how to deal with diversity, um, and and people have different not I only idea but different experience, and we need to understand and uh, enter into the uh, the world of the other people. Thanks, Philo. I think we need you to. Um, talk to some U.S. bishops here. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think we're still praying for synodality to take root in much of North America, and so um, they would do well to listen to both of you. We have, well, I know we're a little bit over time, but I want to get to your question, Bruce. Um, thank you for waiting, and then we'll we'll conclude. So thank you all. All right, thank you. Um, I guess I'd like to ask some questions about where this synodal process is going, especially for the people on the ground. Um, yeah, I know in my own diocese, I we feel like the, the bishop is controlling everything at a very high level, and we're not getting inf information back. We don't, and we don't know how to participate, or if we can. For example, is it is this summary report available? It, did the bishops? Is there a list of expectations for the bishops, what they're supposed to do over the next year? And are they supposed to include the people in the parishes and dioceses in, in the process of thinking about the summary, summary report? I feel like we have to almost scrutinize what we're getting from our bishop. And so I'm kind of asking for some overview of what we might uh, ask the bishop or, or our pastors to do. Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. I'm happy to answer that. Um, presently, if you log on to synod.va, that's synod.va, you'll have access to the letter, the synod letter that was written to the people of God. You'll have access to the synthesis report. It's already there in various languages. And as we go, more languages, are, it's being translated into more languages, but so far it's already there in English, French, Spanish, I think German as well, uh, Portuguese, if I'm not mistaken. But we don't, this second phase is not as long as the first phase. Remember the first phase was from 2021 up until 
2023. So there was enough ample time for the consultations to be done at parish level and then eventually at diocesan level, at conference level, and continental level, at regional level, then continental level, and eventually universal level. So because we have limited time, um, different conferences are having different approaches. Uh, for example, I was having a conversation, not in fact yesterday, no, today actually, I was having a conversation with a bishop from one of the conferences here in Africa, and they had just had their plenary session. And uh, I was just inquiring, how are you doing this? And his answer was, we look at the synthesis report and we look at what relates to our conference from the synthesis report. And we take in that each bishop has the responsibility to ensure that in his diocese, this is addressed and that the people of God have the opportunity to participate in these conversations because the time is so limited. So my suggestion would be that you look at what is the reality in your area based on the synthesis report. If you can look at the entire synthesis report, why not go for it? But do engage, do read that document. It is available online. It's not a secret. You don't have to wait for your bishop or for your parish priest to bring you the document. Go to synod.va, download the document, and start reading it. So that by the time your bishop says, this is the synthesis report. We need to look at it. We need to have conversations and so forth. You at least you'll be way ahead. That's my suggestion, and I think that's what we, as well as a conference here and in, in the SECBC, Southern Africa, which is three countries. That's also going to most likely be our approach. We're also going to look at what matters relate to our region, and if. In the process, like we said, it's a time of listening, it's a time of dialogue. Anyone is welcome to say, what about this topic? Can we include this topic? No one will be stopped from doing that. That's what the synodal journey is about. It's about creating spaces for all of us to engage and to add where there has where there's a need to add. We, we may not have covered everything that everybody wants. So this is a period to also add. It's a continuation. Yeah, thank you. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Yeah, and, and also I think the, uh, during the uh, the preparatory process of the first session, uh, synodal, uh, of, synodal office, I mean, secretariat, especially the senatory, was encouraging people and uh, even if your parish or your diocese uh, is not organizing any uh, preparation, uh, preparation uh, for the uh, second session, um, I, other groups or any any network or even individuals can send the uh, their um, sort of uh, opinion or thought directly to the synod, synod uh, secretariat. And uh, I don't know how they did it, but um, like, for example, that, that the, and then there was a, a digital synod and digital synod had 20 million people participating. So, um, and, and now the, uh, the, the uh, at the synod assembly, I think the importance of uh, digital communication was uh, uh, repeated, re-emphasized. So I'm sure there are other ways if, if your diocese or parish are not really are working. There are other ways uh, to, um, to 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 contribute to this uh, preparatory process of the second session. I think. Yes, thank you, Philo. Thank you, Sheila. Um, I know a lot of reform groups, especially in the U.S., are going to be doing conversations to allow opportunity for reflection and discernment and conversation around the interim document. And we'll, of course, be sending our mm -hmm. our reports to the U.S. Bishops Conference here. And we're part of a something called Region 16, which is sort of for non-diocesan movements and congregations and groups to be able to 
kind of formally participate. So that, that is an avenue as well. And we're hoping to offer some of those sessions in 2024. Um, thank you all so much for being here to mm -hmm. our two speakers. It really just fills my heart to, I mean, the, the, the fact that we can have a conversation of women who were fully participant, participating in the synod process is such a um, moment to celebrate and to combine that with our 48th anniversary is just very, very special. Um, I can't thank you enough for your global perspectives and, and the sort of call to actions that you've given us to continue to, to engage with these conversations, to raise our voices, particularly as global women, to find each other and to collaborate and not to distill our, our message, but to just deepen it and, and make it more visible, more vocal. Um, and to be in dialogue in a, um, on a global scale. So thank you for those charges, for your perspectives, for your prayers, and for your witness in the Synod Hall. It gave me a lot of hope to know that you both were in the, in the room. Uh, and it just, it just, um, it's just amazing. We're, we're living through a moment in church history, and it's a privilege to have you with us to, to share a little bit of your experience. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but I just want to say thank you, thank you for being here. And um, for those who are part of our gala, um, we will be sending out a few more videos uh, the rest of today. And then tomorrow at 11 o'clock Eastern time, we're having our closing liturgy. So if you got the link to join this meeting, you probably got the link to join that one. So I hope to see you tomorrow morning. We have a very full liturgical celebration mm -hmm. with live music, preaching, and um, women preaching, women presiding. So please join us for that celebration tomorrow. And and I will be remiss if I don't say to check out the auction. Uh, we have an online auction of many of our um, very talented members and our very active board who have been collecting and, and donating and, and even creating some of the art that's on auction. So please look through that and um, shop small this holiday season. So thank you, Sister Filo. Thank you, Shayla. Thank you all for being here. It's just a joy, truly. Um, I'm, I'm just, my heart is filled to hear you both um, and to know that you're both making changes at the Vatican. Um, so thank you. Thank you very Thank much you. for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, Kate. Ciao. Thank you.